Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to our weekly uh, Ask the Exec. Um, today with me, I've got um, Becky Sutton, who's Executive Director of Community Health Services, and Claire Teeny, who is, as you know, uh, Executive Director for People and Culture. And um, by way of introduction, I'd also like to welcome Yolanda Martin, who is our new Associate Director of Communications and Related Stuff. And um, Yolanda joined the organisation on Monday and I'm pleased to say has decided to stay. So you're very welcome, Yolanda. Um, so by um, way of sort of summary and introductions, as, as usual, just give you a few heads up of some of the headlines we're working on. Um, and then obviously move over to some of the questions that have been sent in already. But as ever, feel free to contribute yourselves and put things in the chat and we'll try to um, answer them directly today. And if we don't do that, we will um, come back to you and, and get a reply. So the first thing to say is that um, there are, I think, a number of positives, aren't there, in the national media in terms of getting on top of the latest wave of the pandemic. And um, we've just got to hang on in there over the next few weeks while the benefits of the significant reduction in cases starts to, to impact on the admissions to hospitals and the, and the very, and sadly, the, you know, the high number of deaths that are still occurring on a daily basis. Um, the, again, as a general um, piece of information, that the admissions into Nottingham acute hospitals are starting to plateau, um, and we've, we've seen a dip nationally. So um, I'd expect over the next two, three, four weeks, they'll continue to, to reduce, which is really good news. Um, and at the same time, um, we've seen, haven't we, the, the number of people getting vaccinated nationally, um, I think is probably due to hit 10 million today, if not today, tomorrow. And at, at the moment is about um, 340, 350,000 uh, vaccines a day, um, which is quite a staggering number. The vaccinations in the county uh, are going well. We've hit our first two targets for the cohorts around care and residents and staff and the over 80s. There's still quite a significant number of those cohorts to, um, forgive the phrase, mop up and for whatever reason um, weren't able to have the vaccine the first time around, most likely due to either being within a 28 day period of having COVID themselves or concurrent um, medical conditions that made them too unwell. And so there's that work going on. We've got all our vaccine centres open now across the county um, and we're starting to get um, a bit more reliable supply, um, although that is still a bit variable. We're still working on what's called a, a push system. So it comes from the national team um, and is delivered. We don't have any say in when or how much, and it's all done on sort of approximations of populations of the cohort. So that's been a bit tricky um, to navigate through, and um, particularly when we've got, you know, we're getting through seven, 8,000 doses a day. And um, if you haven't got any stock supply and you've got, you know, 16, 24,000 people booked in and you're waiting supply, for supply, it can be a bit challenging. But I expect that that's going to get, um, easier as the weeks pass. I wanted to say a bit more about um, our staff access and our patient access um, to really important parts of this. Um, with regard to staff, um, the significant change in the messaging this week is that um, there's no longer this, this distinction or, or need to identify um, patient facing roles. So the access now is for all staff um, employed and working in the organisation, um, even if affiliated. Um, and th the important 
sub message to that is that there's going to be real focus on getting staff done over the next two weeks um, and then the focus will be on the other cohorts so it's not to say you won't be able to get it after that time um, but that's this is the next two weeks is the key time if you could relay that to your um, peers and colleagues to get access to the vaccine um, we have you'll have seen um, on the Facebook and the chat um, and I, we get a lot of questions from people about um, choice and venue and availability um, and this might I don't want this to come out wrong but um, this is I just want to emphasize the, the sort of command and control nature of this we are delivering this on behalf of the population of the UK on behalf of the NHS for the county um, and for um, and obviously for our staff and patients so um, the sites and the sites um, we'd encourage people to access the local vaccination centres we appreciate they're not on everybody's doorstep and um, it's really important that the second dose is received from the same place um, and that there isn't the the usual sort of choice about time and date and locality and um, if you if you book in get an appointment and attend and um, that's the best thing you can do um we think that the, the recording the numbers is a bit tricky because i won't go into the the um the the detail of the of what lies behind it all but it's difficult to to give an exact number on um numbers done we think um we're we're about five thousand staff in um which is a a, tr a tremendous uh, achievement so about five thousand staff have received their first dose patients uh, has been another challenge that many people have been working on not just here but across the country um and certainly for um the good news today is that um Becky will be smiling because we've started to get vaccinations into Lings Bar Hospital um, as of this morning. I think probably as we speak, Becky, there are there are patients receiving vaccine at Lings Bar and that's provided by what's called a roving team service. So um, again, it's not prescribed by us because the, the legals around it don't allow us to at the moment. And the team come in with the vaccine and they can they can give it to to our staff in localities. Um, more broadly, um, we're just working through the prioritisation groups. We've been designated what's called a, a hospital hub for administrative purposes. So um, the, the, the two centres that means that we can um, now receive and distribute um, vaccine internally within the organisation. Um, and we'll be working in with um, senior leads around um, which patient groups are priority um, through um, mental health services for older people and patients um, and others and we hope to begin to um, provide those vaccinations from next week um, which is a really good position to be in and um, so watch out for um, details about that. Um, th that's probably enough on vaccines and um, I just wanted to um, probably Finish my introduction around it with a um, an acknowledgement of um, Captain Sir Tom Moore, who very sadly um, passed away yesterday. Um, after what um, I think everybody would agree was was a, um, a really inspirational, and motivational um, stepping onto the stage um, during the pandemic, and um, probably captured everybody's hearts in terms of. And um, not only what he did, but his phenomenal fundraising um, and his life story. Um, so it, it was um, it's very sad to hear of his passing. Um, but what a tremendous achievement. Um, there's a, a, a question in the in the um, that's been sent in, which we'll, we'll pick up in a bit more detail. But um, essentially the, the, the organisation um, has benefited to the tune of about ninety five thousand pounds of um, Captain Tom monies. And um, the, the, they will be used and are being used for a number of um, different things, largely centred around supporting staff well-being. 
Um, so some of the packs that um, teams have been receiving have been funded by Captain Tom Munnies. Um, we've also been um, planning putting some benches up to commemorate him, to commemorate him and his achievements um, in some outside spaces for um, for walks, and um, also looking at um, purchasing some digital technology to enable um, inpatients, particularly to remain connected to their family and loved ones. So um, we are um, continuing to to um, distribute that um, throughout the organisation. Um, so Alex, that's um, probably as much as I um, want to say initially by way of introduction. Um, happy to hand back to you. Oh, thank you, John. And um, as you said, there, there is a question that was asked on Facebook yesterday, um, just asking, is there anything we can do to pass on our condolences to Sir Captain uh, Moore's family from the RNHS Trust from all of us? Or even a picture, feel like we should do something in his memory, knowing what he did for us? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. And um, we've been we have acknowledged it within our social media feeds um, and the NHS more broadly will be um, thanking um, his family and him for, for what he's done. Um, in terms of a specific um, organisational response, we haven't um, we haven't considered that um, specifically. Uh, it's probably early days, but I, I think it's a really good question. I think um, I think that emotions are so strong and um, supportive of what we've done and it'd be a nice thing to do wouldn't it absolutely i completely agree um there's a question in the chat that's come in from kumar um are we having ways to measure the vaccination uptake of our workforce including um bame at directorate level i know you've touched on this slightly already john yeah so and uh, claire might want to um add a bit more detail but um Thanks, Kumar. Good question. And um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, whether we've got um, access to the outputs of that recording at the moment, I'm not too sure about. But um, more broadly, within the uh, vaccination programme um, that, that we're leading on organisationally, we've started to get some really rich data on um, a whole range of um, different variables, not just in terms of um, the geography where the uptake may be low and um, the disadvantaged areas um, and the people with um, with vulnerabilities, comorbidities, etc. And that, and that data is starting to inform where some of the gaps are and will include um, uh, and BAME data um, and um, people from other disadvantaged groups. So um, we will be doing that and we will be looking at how we can then respond to what that data in, informs us. So, for example, we've um, over the weekend and into this week, we've put some roving team vaccinators um, into three mosques in the, in the middle of Nottingham, um, working with local faith leaders to um, enable the access in, in those um, Muslim groups to to increase. Claire, I don't know if you want to say anything in more detail about um, within the organisation, if you know anything more. Hi, um, hi everybody. As John said, for people that don't know me, my name is Claire Tini. I'm Director of People and Culture. Um, good to be able to join you this afternoon and to and um, just to kind of expand a bit on the point about vaccinations for our staff. So yes, we will be collating all of that data around um, staff and staff groups that have accessed the vaccine um, and received it. And um, what we need to do that is cross-reference the vaccination record with our ESR um, staff record and so we do have to bring those systems together so we haven't got that detailed information available at the minute but it is something that will be available to us um, it's good information for us to have to see if we need to do any um, extra targeting or engagement with particular um, groups of, of colleagues Equally, we are um, required to report on that. So that information is being collected regionally and nationally. So we should have that detail in due course. We think about circa 
4,000 of our staff so far have accessed the vaccine. Um, we know um, we know some of the details of that are absolute, but because people have got access to a lot of vaccination centres, we haven't got all of the detail readily um, available to us. I'd just like to mention a couple of other points really on the vaccination, if I could, John, just while we're on the, the topic. And the first thing is to say a huge um, shout out actually to a number of our staff and friends and families of our staff who've either signed up and or volunteered to work in the vaccination programme across the county. Um, there's been a really phenomenal effort and response from people, um, people that work directly with the organisation and or are associated with it in some other way. And that's been um, hugely valued and it, it really warms the heart actually when you see uh, mixed teams of colleagues from across the whole of the NHS and local authorities working um, in the vaccination centres, along with other support and emergency services to deliver this programme of work. I think it's just a real reflection of how, when a whole system comes together, some of the things that it can achieve. Um, and uh, just to share a little example, actually, um, today what's being worked through across the county is how in some of the vaccination centres we protect some time and slots uh, extend opening hours are, are are varying what we're doing to um, specifically be able to vaccinate some of the more vulnerable citizens within our society, particularly we've got some younger adults with learning disabilities that come into a centre where it's busy and full and there's a there's a slightly, I won't say rush throughput, but a th faster throughput isn't the best environment for people to receive their vaccination. So colleagues are working really hard to make those adjustments to ensure that those citizens um, receive their vaccination in a timely way. And I think those sorts of stories um, are, again, hugely warming. That It's great that that's being done, but the, that colleagues are really stepping up to ensure that that happens. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Claire. Alex, before we go on to the next one, I just wanted to pick up something that um, Catherine has kindly put in the chat, which is a a dedicated session for BME staff network um, on the 18th of February and it's also reminded me that um, we had a, a, a meeting with um, myself, the chair, um, some others, I think medical director Julie Hankin, um, Catherine was on the call um, with the BME leads about how we could collectively help both um, the countywide vaccination program, but also internally um, encourage um, more people from BME background to access the vaccine. Um, and and they were putting together um, some products, um, including videos and perhaps that webinar as well to help. Um, for example, um, bust some of the myths around the vaccine, help give people a safe space to ask questions. Um, and, and provide more information about it. Um, so, uh, Catherine, thanks for um, flagging that. It was a good reminder for me. Thanks, John. That's great. Um, there's a question that has is, that is, um, been sent in on the chat from Judith okay. Dixon. Um, what is the current situation on community staff entering care homes if they are not lateral flow testing? We've had an issue in entering a care home this morning. Oh, that's a great, good question. Um, I don't know, Becky, whether you might be able to um, to answer it. Um, I don't know what the current situation is. So I can have a go. Thanks, John. Um, so, um, I mean, it may be this particular situation we need to take offline, but I think this just um, highlights um, in terms of encouragement for staff to carry on lateral flow testing, regardless of whether they've had a vaccine or not, which is the message um, that we've done. It looks like someone's just put in the chat it has been resolved i think um this was around um different systems so obviously care homes um being quite strict around um people entering the care homes if they hadn't had a lateral flow test and i think there was a little bit of discrepancy if i remember rightly around whether that was um a lateral flow test from the care home or ones that our staff were doing ourselves issued by ourselves um so it does look like it's been resolved but I think it's just that encouragement at this point we still don't really know from a vaccine point of view whether that um, changes transmission of the disease so I think as an organisation the encouragement is that we continue to lateral flow test 
the staff to keep our patients safe um, going forward until we've got um, more confidence on that data. Um, so that's absolutely the message. And I think that that is a particular issue um, around who's done the test, but it looks like it's been resolved, but happy to pick it up outside of this meeting if there's any more I can help with. Thanks, Becky. Sorry to put you on, on, on the spot there. Um, just more broadly, you're right about the, um, at the moment there is, well, until this morning, actually, there hadn't been much data around um, the impact of the vaccines on transmission. Um, and we are still recommending that, that even though people have had the vaccine to continue to use PPE and test, et cetera. Um, but to reference the, the study that um, the health secretary was talking about um, on the AZ vaccine, that there was a significant reduction in transmission for those who are vaccinated. I think the figure was something like two thirds to 70 percent reduction in transmission, which um, if, I, if I've remembered it correctly, is um, very significant and um, will have um, an impact on some of the rules that we've just described and reiterated to continue. We might be able to, to begin to um, relax those at a later stage, but um, certainly not as of now, but um, potentially really good news ahead on that. Um, thanks, John. Um, Katrina Benjamin is just asking, is that following both doses? I don't know if you if you know the answer to that. No, I don't. Um, it'll it'll be. Um, I just caught it on the radio before as I was coming in. So um, I'm sure if people look in, um, in in the in the news media, they'll be able to find a link to the detail of the study. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. No. Thank you, John. Um, just for um, anybody that's watching on the video, um, Judith has put in the chat a um, link to the previous question. Uh, just for clarity, it's staff who can't lateral flow test due to being positive in the last 90 days, not a reluctance to test. So um, thanks for that. Thanks for that cl clarity, Judith. And as, as Becky said, she'll be looking into that in more detail. So thank you. Um, we've had some more questions sent in um, and um, there's a question which is just related to um, staff absence um, and we've had um, it states I've had two absences one related to catching Covid and a second recent absence due to losing a parent. Having returned to work this week, my line manager sent a diary invite to say I have triggered a first stage sickness absence meeting, um, one where I can bring someone with me for support. As a senior management team that sets the tone for a supportive culture at a time when staff sickness is at a high in the midst of a national crisis, is this the tone that you wish managers to send to staff? Is the trust sickness management policy for valid sickness reasons the highest priority at the moment above the well-being of staff? And I don't know if you wish to um, address yes, that uh, initially. Uh, I'll, I'll, if I say something um, general and then perhaps ask Claire to, um, to go into, the, into, into perhaps a bit more detail that, that she'll, she'll know about. Just um, by the by, as I was about to start to answer that, I had a message on my computer screen that <laughs> just says, from the from the from the IT thing, uh, virus threat detected on your computer. So, oh, so if I go off in a in a in a blank haze or something, that's what's happened. It seems to be working okay. Um, this is a really important topic, and um, I I I would come at it from where we are in terms of our um, culture and values. It's really important that we have. Um, a, a culture in the organisation that that can um, take into account people's circumstances and challenges, and um, whether it's sickness or you know all the things that people are having to manage in their lives at the moment. Um, so we have to be compassionate, and we have to be kind, and we have to um, you know treat people as we'd like to be treated ourselves. Having said that, um, at the same time, we, we do have to have um, policies and procedures that um, you know, our, our managers can use that um, give good, reliable guidance on how to manage the multiple situations that they, they have to you know, manage day in, day out. Um, 
And sickness and absence is, has been a real challenge, hasn't it, to keep on top of during the pandemic for all sorts of reasons. And this is a really good example. Um, so more broadly, I would hope that those circumstances will be taken into account and that people will be treated um, respectfully and well. But the, um, I'm going to ask Claire if she could um, just go into the more sort of specifics of, of this without getting into sort of detail of individual cases, because we don't want to do that on on these calls. But Claire, if you could um, follow on from my sort of intro. Um, thank, thanks, John. Um, so there's a few things from me. So the, the, the technicalities of this are that um, where things have been COVID related, then actually they don't what we call trigger for sickness absence um, purposes. I think it's important to set the context that actually we pre-pandemic and during pandemic, we recognise that there's more work to do around our sickness procedure. Um, because for me, where people are off work, I don't get into a conversation about whether that's valid absence or not. I think if people are, are off work, then they're off work for what are always, to my mind, very valid reasons that are very personal to them. And actually, the, the space that, that we should get into and need to get into and that does happen actually across the organisation very frequently is one of a person-centred supportive conversation um, that enables people to feel um, supported while they're off work and supported to return to work and it's getting to that space that whatever the reason somebody is not in that actually that's the approach that we that we take so um, I think it's fair to say that there is work for us to do on that um, and we are signed up to doing that and we're working with our staff side colleagues to work all of that through. But the technical answer around should something trigger or not is that for anything that's COVID related, it um, it, it doesn't. Um, we have got, um, we did start an engagement group actually that um, was working through the whole of the sickness policy with us because I, um, I think it was fair to say and we recognised and from the feedback that staff had given us that it had almost become a bit too prescriptive so um, it was just being um, applied too many times um, without that person thinking going into it and actually that's not what it's about or, or how we should be using it um, so that that I think in response to is this the tone that we would expect or how we would expect to see things work. I think um, if that's how it's felt, then the answer is uh, the answer is no. Thank you ever so much, Claire. Um, there's um, a question which is um, just um, um, to um, is there an update, please, on the question that has previously been posed on whether the COVID cases are riddle reportable? I don't know if you want to answer that, Claire. Um, so it's not straightforward, yes or no, because no riddle reported, no reportable cases are a blanket, yes or no. Um, so it's not a case of if this happens, does that make something riddle reportable? So the process for riddle is where people are off or absent from work for a number of days and there may be a requirement to report that absence to the health and safety executive. There's a whole series of assessments that then need to take place to determine whether that is the approach or not. And the HSE, along with um, lots of other bodies nationally, have been working through this whole process and have issued guidance around in COVID circumstances what may trigger um, something that is RID or reportable. We have an internal process that goes through that, that looks at all of our um, incident reports, that looks at all of our outbreak situations, all of the data that we have around absence management. And we do work that through quite rigorously. And if anything is HSE reportable, then that is reviewed and is signed off by the executive team. Um, so that's the kind of internal process and that's aligned to the national guidance as it currently stands. Um, I would also say that we don't do that as an organisation in isolation. So the way that we also work that through is we do cross reference, our health and safety leads do cross reference with other health and safety leads, certainly from across the Nottinghamshire and the wider um, system to ensure that actually 
we're not doing anything that's out of sync and that um, we're not missing anything that we should be missing. So um, I hope that that gives a bit of a description of what we do, because it's not a straightforward yes or no to the answer, if that makes sense. That's great. Thank you ever so much, Claire. Um, just um, got a, um, a question which um, again was on Facebook and I thought it'd be good to share on here. How can I or a member of my family volunteer at a vaccination site? Yeah, so um, I know this because it's written in front of me, but um, just the more broadly though, um, just people, people know this, but it's, it's probably worth reiterating that um, you know, we're only down to um, cohort four by the middle of February, and there's I think another five plus cohorts to go. So ten million, there's another sixty, you know, another fifty plus million to do. And um, this is going to be a um, a, a long term program. We've um, recruited I think over two thousand. And staff to the to the bank through the Sherwood Forest Bank. We've got a, a load of volunteers um, helping out, um, which is brilliant. Um, the, it, the the number of volunteers that were that were you know keen to to help and support was phenomenal initially, and there was a waiting list. Um, I don't know if Alex, if you can put those links um, into the chat. Um, Absolutely. That, 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 people, that people could then um, pick up. But um, if there is a waiting list, don't, you know, again, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, don't don't be dispirited and think I'm not going to be able to get a go because this is going to be going on for many months um, and um, may indeed become something a bit like the flu jab that um, because just becomes business as usual, that we might need to update it to, to we, we might, the people that understand about vaccines will, you know, might need to have different um, combinations of vaccine to 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 mirror the, the different strains that come each year. So this is going going to become um, you know business, and, but it's going to take us a you know some many months to get there. And um, the the more staff that we can get involved in both the vaccination, the volunteering, and support um, would be really welcome. So there's a couple of links there that um, Alex has put in the in the chat of people then. Um, um, either want to get involved directly or um, I've got friends and family that want to volunteer too. Thanks, John. Um, moving um, moving back and just to um, just to make sure that we've asked all of the questions. I know you touched on this at the beginning, um, but we've had a question. Um, the second dose, does it have to be at the same vaccine centre you had the first dose? I understand there is a time frame, but just to simply change the date of the second dose to a different date in the same week that was automatically booked. Obviously, a card was given with batch numbers, etc. on. Hoping to change the day and location to a closer centre, now more have become available. I'm just wondering if you wanted to um, address that directly, John. Yes, I will, and I don't know whether then Claire might want to say um, something too. So, um, ideally, yes, that um, go back to the, the the place where you had your first one. The the we we need we need to be sure that um, we've got supply of both at, at the at the centres. So, um, just for example, if you had Pfizer at um, I don't know um, Newark. Um, and the second dose is due, um, we need to be sure internally that Pfizer is available. And so there's a whole load of um, log internal logistics um, to manage that. And that's going to get more complicated as more vaccines get approved. Um, but um, uh, in the, the piece I've got that um, we're going to clarify that internally so we can get a more um, finalised message. Claire, is that right? Um, so uh, yes, John. As it stands at the as it stands at the minute, um, there's a there's a couple of of things actually. So as you pointed out, we are still at the early stages of this um, vaccination program. Um, that said, there are a lot of vaccinations that have already been completed, and this has been a program that has started up at scale and pace. So we started vaccinating on what the seventh or eighth of December. 
which was not too long ago, and it's ramped up regionally um, and nationally. And the logistics that are associated with this are really complicated. So to ensure people do get their second dose, that's being planned in around people attending the same site um, that they uh, received their first dose from, because we have to do that in terms of how we receive the stock. So not everything is within our control to be able to be flexible about where people go to and change appointments. So as a program, as, a, as with all programs, as they become more established and things settle down, and you get through larger numbers. It might be that that situation changes into the future. But for the here and now, there's an ask of people really to work with us um, on this and go back to their original site. Um, it saves a lot of complications and it also um, helps us mitigate risks about people getting missed um, and um, having com further complications to vaccine supply. Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Claire. Um, just to highlight that we've just had um, one more question um, sent in. So if there is any final um, questions, we've just got until 12.45 for the for the remaining session. Um, but the the final question is linked to um, what you've what you've just said, really, Claire, which is um, Will we be able to attend City Hospital for a vaccine? I don't drive and use public transport, so many of the places are difficult to get to other than the forest ground, which doesn't have any appointments. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so um, I don't mind, Claire, if you want to take that or I do, don't mind. You're on the screen. So, um, so what we are um, asking people to do at the minute is attend the sites that we do have available. Um, as I say, it's quite prescriptive um, about uh, what vaccines going into where and for what use actually, and that is also an ever changing picture. So, um, as it stands at the minute, we haven't got um, city that's um, available. But what we can do, if someone would, if if whoever is there is having particular difficulty with that, what we can do is have a look and see how we can support someone to get to get a vaccine if there are particular problems. There is a um, there is the health and wellbeing team and the COVID-19 team that people can contact with the specifics, mm -hmm. but generally we're only to put, we're only able to support vaccines out of the current um, centres. Thank you, Claire. Um, Craig has just sent in a, a message. I assume asking to change the second type of vaccine for your second dose might be impossible. Personally, I am happy to be involved in any studies available. Um, so yeah, I, um, thanks. And at the moment, there isn't. Um, you're right. It, that is impossible. It's um, you've got to have the same vaccines you had the first time. Um, we may we may get to a point in the future where um, there'll be some studies that look at mixing them. Um, although. What do I know about vaccines? I don't know very much about vaccines. I think that's probably unlikely. Um, but yeah, we'll watch this space and um, those sorts of studies are, are always um, keen to get volunteers. And I know that, um, that the, um, the Acute Trust at NUH and um, the Crips Health Centre were involved in some of the, the large scale um, national studies. So look out for that. But you're right, um, Craig, at the moment, that's a no. That's great. Thank you, John. Um, and just to highlight what Tracy Guilford has said, and I would absolutely echo this, is um, um, I had my vaccine this morning and I'd like to say thank you to Sherwood Forest Hospitals. It was so quick and well managed. The staff were really welcoming too. And um, yeah, I've been there as well. And I absolutely, um, you know, say that they were fantastic. So that, that's good um, to hear, isn't it? And um the thing about that is that um, a lot of the staff um, involved in the, the programme at Sherwood Forest are our staff too. Um, but I'll, I'll pass on those those kind comments to um, the Chief Executive Sherwood Forest. I'm sure he'd be pleased to hear it. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, and uh, Nikki Foreman has said same goes for the Newark Showground team. So phenomenal. So um, thank you ever so much. We don't have any more questions, John. Um, I don't know yeah. if there's any further updates that anybody wants to give in the last four minutes. Oh, Claire's got a hand up. 
So, <laughs> oh, and I will, um, I'll go to Claire, and then I, I've just got a couple of final things that I'd like to say before we before we wrap up. Um, Alex, thanks. And Catherine Conch has also got a hand up as well. Um, so Catherine is probably going to say um, something about what I was going to say about LGBT plus history month. So I'll leave that to Catherine to cover off in a bit more um, detail. But also, I mean, um, just huge thanks to, to all of our staff, everything that you are doing. Um, really appreciate it. I know that people are, continue to be extremely flexible um, and supportive in terms of delivering um, services to our patients and service users. So just wanted to um, echo that thanks um, again and that appreciation. Um, in terms of the vaccine, we'll also send out, um, people talked about volunteering, um, we will continue to onboard staff who also want to be in paid work. This is going to be a long haul programme and as John said, we're going to need people to work with us over the, the next few months so we can also share that out and put that out to encourage people to get the vaccine if you have got particular difficulty in accessing a site if you let us know then we'll work with you to, to make sure that we do what we can to support you getting a vaccination that's really really um, important and I couldn't not mention um, the staff survey. Um, we will have some detailed feedback for you all, hopefully at the end of this month, beginning of March, about um, what the staff survey said, the comments that you provided to us. But thank you to everybody who filled in the survey last year. Um, we had a really good response rate, hugely grateful for that. And we will be utilising everything that you said and fed back to us to inform um, the decisions that we take going forward. So. That was me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you ever so much. And as John says, he's uh, he usually mentions it um, every week, even though it's embargoed. So uh, we'll <laughs> we're still to find out when the embargo is going to be lifted. But as soon as it is, I will let you know, John. Um, hi, Catherine. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, Claire. That was a good introduction, Claire. Thank you. So, yes, uh, just to remind everybody that February is LGBT plus history month. Um, it's a time to reflect, but it's also a time to celebrate. And I'll be doing a stint at uh, Connecting Knots on the 8th of February. So tune in if you want to hear a bit more in eight minutes flat. The other thing that I was going to mention is that at the Diversibility Steering Group, uh, this week, we talked about appointments to different places for vaccines. And we understand that if you have a disability, which means that you can't stand out in the rain or the cold, there are specific uh, plans in place. So you notify someone at the check-in centre and say that you've got a particular condition that means you can't be outside or you need to sit down because you've got a disability, then please do ask them. Thank you. That's great. Thank you ever so much, Catherine. John, I don't know if there's anything that you want to say as um, final words in the last 30 seconds. Um, so 30 seconds, I'd like to um, say a couple of things. One, and don't forget, you can still get your flu jab. Um, if Anne-Maria was, she'd be telling you if she was live on the call. Um, uh, and uh, a call to arms to please keep um, adhering to all the messages around PPE social distancing we're a long way from being out of the woods yet and um, the i'm touching wood um and i've got fingers crossed that the outbreaks um look like they're slowing down a bit and that's thanks to you know everybody that's involved in trying to oversee and manage these and stay safe but to keep our guard up god i sound a bit like matt hancock don't i um but um it's really important that we continue to do that um, and then finally, uh, in terms of echoing the thanks to everybody for what they're doing, we know we hardly ever talk about the, um, the organisation um, that isn't involved in the COVID. And so we're a half a billion pound you know, organisation seeing hundreds and thousands of people and providing care. I just wanted to particularly say thank you to all those people behind the scenes that are continuing to help the organisation run so smoothly that might not be directly involved in COVID or vaccination work um, that um, are doing a tremendous job keeping um, us safe, helping us support our patients and service users. Um, we're in a, a good place um, and I think thanks to them too. 
that's it from me. Thank you, Alex. Thank you ever so much, John. And um, Anne Maria is, um, has been it has um, highlighted on the call as well. And I think she's possibly snuck in just to make sure that you mentioned flu, John. So that's fantastic. And she says thanks for that. Um, and um, and she's also highlighted that outbreaks have slowed down um, and there's been nothing for a week, which is absolutely fantastic. So, um, but uh, thank you all very much. And um, again, the the meeting will be on again. It will be it's um, as you all know, it's recorded. It will be available on Connect, on Facebook, anywhere else. Um, the, and um, and we'll, the meeting again will be on next week. So if you've got any questions, please send them in advance to staff engagement um, or, um, or just uh, join the meeting and share them in the chat. So thank you ever so much. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Thanks all. Bye. Bye. Bye.